and welcome to Theory Craft, the channel that loves a good moaning just as much as Officer Crabtree. We may as well be his sons. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> me and Jack are discussing probably one of the weirder movies that came out of the mid '80s towards the tail end of well, tail beginning of the early '90s, where it. I was surprised there was a third movie for it because I've never seen it aired anywhere, but it is known as the never-ending story that obviously did end at the third film. But the thing is, this movie, while it is a cult classic and there are some very choice moments, I don't think in today's society, as we discussed last week, or not, not even that, the week before, about cancel culture... I'm surprised they hadn't thought about cancelling this movie yet. So, without further ado, let's get ready to end. So, The Never Ending Story is a very bizarre film in terms that it's a story within a story. Like, the only way you can describe the film is that it starts off with. A dad and his son, his partner's passed, so there's no mum for this kid. Kid basically is just obviously hurt over the loss of his mum and is not very close with his dad. Dad doesn't really do much to try and actually be quite a good father figure other than just provide the like roof over his head and food in his belly and that's about it. The kid has some school issues where he's being harassed by three bullies and basically his only way of escaping reality is by reading books because long before the internet came along, that was the only way in which any of us nerdy lot actually escaped reality. Yes. But the thing is, this is where this movie starts to slowly fall apart. So the kid is on his way to school. I don't know what city it is in America, but he decides to sort of go through the city itself to, you know, just trundle along before he goes to school, as you do. Yeah. And he gets harassed by the three bullies. So he goes flying, he goes hiding in a dumpster, and he gets rid of them. And then he decides that, you know what? How about I go run in this bookstore which nobody seems to go in because it doesn't look like much of a bookstore, just to hide from him a little bit longer. And there's this surly old man that's just reading one of his many thousand upon books that aren't even on shelves. They're just stacked like from the floor high. And the guy's like, oh, just bugger off, kid, because he's a grumpy old man. And he's on about how he likes to escape in books because it escapes from reality, blah, 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 blah. And just casually lets the kid take the never ending storybook. As you do. Yeah. So then said kid finally gets to school and everyone's in class and he thinks, you know what, I don't want I'm not gonna go into my lesson. I'm gonna go up into the annex of the sports hall or wherever it is in the school and start reading this book. At no point in this entire movie has anybody decided to search for this kid to check that he's actually in school. So it's, that's one thing that I never understood about this movie, is how the hell did the kid manage to escape an eight-hour day at school without well, being well, well, clearly they didn't have very good whistleblowing. Or just nobody noticed. <laughs> but again, this is one of the things that surely both is just a bad option. Like, how bad a school must you be to not give a shit if a kid doesn't turn up to class? I don't I don't know. You say that. A lot of my teachers didn't notice. <laughs> well, yeah, but this is different times where kids were probably more accounted for. And to be fair, it is American schools. Like, obviously, if there are certain fiascos at a certain thing in America where it's quite frequent. Columbine. Uh, <laughs> it's, um, we won't talk about Columbine. <laughs> no, no. But it's just, it boggles my mind that a kid can escape from his teachers for eight hours just in a random loft to read a book. 
as you do. Yeah. So the kid starts reading the book, and then you finally get into the whole point of the movie is that it's the never ending story about Fantasia. And it sort of explains that how the entire world is crumbling apart, yada, yada, yada. But what I don't understand, okay, is the never ending story. The film is basically set around the premise that it's a kid reading the book. But there is actual books called The Never Ending Story. So why not just write like, do the movie about the world within the book, not make it be the movie about a kid reading about the book that becomes reality? Wait, you see where wait, I'm going so, with this? Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The story is about a kid reading about the story, but then the story, the actual the... story becomes the story what <laughs> yeah i know i know that like, i've loved that, this movie that is, a, that is a paradox it is a mind melt it really is i love this movie because me and my mum we have always loved fantasy stuff and it's the one thing that we it's that and labyrinth is the two movies we will happily watch time and time again but there are it's such a bizarre movie in itself I mean, you got so many random characters that you sort of meet within like the first few minutes of deep diving into Fantasia. You got this like behemoth of a rock giant that just casually eating rock, which leads into what I said to you the other day when we were doing Return to Oz about the rock guy. That if he's smoking a pipe that's made out of rock, he's technically smoking himself. So if you've got a creature that's made out of rock and is eating rock, is that cannibalistic or is it something else well it depends well it, de it depends really is it sentient yeah yeah well sure like, it's cannibalism then well the gut the the rock creature is sentient it's got this bizarre like the entire thing is that it's a rock giant that has a rock motorcycle and eats rock <laughs> i know like, <laughs> like looking back on it i'm just thinking I'm, I'm just wondering, over the time that we've done Theorycraft, why does all your cult classics always sound like massive acid trips? <laughs> Good question, no I, answer. I, actually, no, they probably were, to be honest. <laughs> well, <laughs> it gets steadily worse from there. So, you got, like, a random goblin-ish character, which looks quite cool. And then you've got a random character that looks like the Mad Hatter's distant cousin from a different race, because yeah. he's darker skin, but he's riding a giant snail. Somehow, this giant snail is really fast, and it neighs like a horse. <laughs> a, a snail that neighs. Yeah, I know. It goes... <laughs> it's just like, I mean, the thing I didn't realise is that this movie is actually German. Originally, like it was, it was a combination of being filmed in Germany, the UK, America, and Canada. But the majority of the scenes of Fantasia were filmed in Germany, and all the actors spoke German. But when it came to the US and UK release, they dubbed over the English dialogue ah so that's why the lip thing doesn't make yeah, yeah, yeah. that's when i was watching clips that's why it doesn't make sense yeah i know because i was looking at it i was thinking yeah it's what... I, was, I was looking at it, it's like those old crappy japanese films when they go i want yeah. to like kung fu master you know <laughs> yeah because i was watching it the other day and i was thinking Am I, is my movie like lagging or something because it just like the sound was going but the lips weren't in sync with it it was like <laughs> but yeah, I mean... Uh, no, it makes sense. That's why it didn't look right. I get no, it now. No, but the one thing that I was quite impressed with this movie is the amount of effort they put in terms of props because that show probably one of the most iconic characters within the entire thing. Well, it was still back in like, the days when physical effects were... My physical effects were really... The big thing, like, because they didn't have very high dependency on CGI or anything back then, because it wasn't really, it didn't really come about till like Toy Story in the nineties. Yeah, well, this is it. But this is probably one of the most iconic characters oh, to I date. Love this. this is so cool. Fa 
So this is Falcor, the dragon. Okay. They had two different versions, which I cannot for the life of me remember why they had two different versions. But that one there weighed 200 pounds. So, like, then that, and obviously, I'm assuming that's a like full working animatronic. Mm. The, the whole head and all that had like working animatronics. It had a skeletal structure, but it was incredible how much effort they put into it. I mean, again, it's bizarre that you look at it, and obviously, it's very basic animatronics. So the lips only went, yeah, but this, yeah, but at the time, this was like state of the art. But the thing is, it's that's the thing, it was very well done. It's just, it's kind of sad how movies are getting more and more like this. Sorry, less and less like this. Well, yeah, I mean, um, because even you had, um, like a very recent example when you had that scene in Avengers Endgame when they're all walking towards like the uh, uh, the machine where obviously you take the pin particles and go back to their different timelines because even when they're wearing the suits and everything it looks real they could have done like the the time travelling suits which they had it, with physical effects and actually had proper costumes but they're not, they're all CGI but which I would argue puts somebody out of a job because normally a costume maker you'd need at least five people to deal with at least half the production's worth of like costumes. Now you probably need maybe two people at the most to just design something and layer it over the top. Yeah, I know, but like you said, it kind of puts it kind of puts something like somebody out of a job. I mean, yeah, I don't I like how good the effects would look, but at the same time, there is a so it's like kind of a lot of things even in Star Wars and everything, when they did when George Lucas didn't have a choice, he had to do a lot of physical effects for real. And then with like this film as well, and like those ones before it, even ET, one of the best animatronics ever. No, that is real, and you know a real animatronic. And the, I always say it with I always say this with physical effects. There's a magic to it. You feel like you're actually, it's the magic of watching a a real film. But whereas it's so overdubbed with CGI, I feel really disconnected from those films personally, despite how good they are. Yeah, I completely agree. But this is where my next point comes in, because you mentioned Star Wars. Apparently, I can't find any photo evidence to prove it, but apparently C-3PO, Chewbacca and Yoda are in that movie. I have heard this. Uh... And I'm just, <laughs> I'm just thinking, how? I don't know, because I have heard this, but I have seen nothing to... No. I've seen nothing to corroborate that. But, I mean, that's got to be the most... Biz- the even weirder part is that apparently Mickey Mouse is in it and so is E.T. Wait, so when this film was made in the 80s, right? 1984 it came out. 1984 and E.T. was in either early 80s or late 70s. And obviously Star Wars was in 77, 79, yeah. But it's the fact that Mickey Mouse is there is what threw me off most of all, because it's not a Disney thing. I was just about to ask you that. Because I tried looking it up on Disney Plus to see whether or not it could be on there. Isn't there? Well, who's it owned by? It's owned by Lucasfilm. Oh, LucasArts? Yes. Or just Lucasfilm? Lucasfilm. Lucasfilm, yeah. Technically, I suppose it is House of Mouse now. But it wasn't then. No. But again, it's still not on Disney Plus, which is really confusing because, yeah. That's odd. (laughs) But it just boggles my mind as to if this is true, whether those characters are there, why? Like, what's the point? (laughs) What What does it add to the actual story itself? Like, just because (laughs) the whole premise behind the never-ending story within the first film, at least, is that you get. A hunter child called Atreyu that basically has to go on a quest to save Fantasia from being destroyed, goes on an epic journey, for it all to basically circle back to the point where it began, to meet the childlike Empress. And this is where the ending of the movie I don't get. So she knows that she's in a story, and the only way in which Fantasia can survive is if the reader comes up with a new name for her. 
that's literally the pre- the like ending to the movie is the fact that well it's not the full ending but it's the ending to his quest where the reader has to come up with a new name for her so that the reality of Fantasia can carry on. But, well, that's, well, that's quite anticlimactic. <laughs> yeah, I know. But the thing is, the poor kid goes through so much trial and tribulation. Like, he gets beaten down, he gets attacked by wolves, which, I, weirdly enough, the actor, when he was being attacked by the animatronic wolves, did actually lose his eye. Like, oh, it... It, oh, yeah, it, yeah. Well, it sort of ruined. It basically scarred his eyes, so he lost the sight out of one of his eyes. Really? Yeah. Oh my goodness. But there is a lot of random things within the whole film itself. But I think it will forever be known as the pinnacle of saddest moments within a movie for an animal. Yeah. The four war horse you had the death of Atreus' horse in the Swamp of Sadness, which is still quite traumatic to today, I think. <laughs> but apparently it was very difficult to get the horse to pretend like it was sinking because horses don't like to, like... Well, horses don't act. <laughs> no. But the thing is, horses can be trained, but it was just being resilient to the whole fact that it was in a sinking, boggy mess. Well, yeah, because surely instinct would take over for the poor horse. Well, this is it, because horses technically can swim and they do float to a degree. So that whole scene where it sinks kind of defeats itself. Exactly. But this is the scene in which I wanted to cover, basically, because... I have no issues with it, but as we said last time, with cancel culture, is people get a bit iffy regardless. Can you remember from the movie where you got the Sphinx, where they guard the doorway and they blast anyone that's not true of heart or like got a yes. purity of heart? Now, in today's world, I would imagine a lot of Karens would kick up on this what? because, well, you tell me, dude. You tell me. They are... The Sphinx is women? It's more the point that they're not very... What? I'm trying to think of the most PG... Uh, Sorry, I'm not saying it PG. Massive titties. I'm trying to think PG. Massive titties. (laughs) But But, there's no no way about it, Rick. But this is what cancel culture loves to do most, is the fact that if they deem something too sexualized, they oh, will find a way of nitpicking sake. it. I have no issues with it, but again... I, I don't really see any problem. Yes, but I, we are blokes. We are deemed demons if we think yeah, anything. Yeah, but at the same at the same time... Oh, for God's sake, this is going back to the cancel culture thing again. Can you really argue with a woman's size that she was born with? No. Exactly. So, and plus, it's an artist's representation as well. So, just for God's sake, just leave it. (laughs) To be fair, though, the author of the actual book itself wasn't overly pleased with the way that they made them too voluptuous, is exactly what he said. Apparently, they rendered them too voluptuous. But... (laughs) I don't like that word. It's weird. Um, But carrying on. So let's have a look. What other bizarre things can we say about this saga of a movie that, while I do love it to bits, I just don't fully comprehend the logic behind it all because it was it's a story within a story that somehow, by the end of the movie, melds into one. But because how? Well, the ending of the movie is like the kid comes up with a new name for the empress. Everything's safe. Fantasia's back to normal, and because Falcor is a luck dragon, the reader is allowed a wish. So what does he do? He wishes Falcor to be real so he can ride him down the alleyway and chase the bullies into the waste bin that he was chucked into earlier on in the movie. 
And that's it. That that's the entire end of the movie. Like you have one scene with the dad, you barely get two lines out of him. The kid who reads the book barely says anything. I don't like, there is there is no need for the whole outer world experience thing. You could just literally do it about the world of Fantasia without the exterior part of it. Yes. I just I don't get it. I really don't. I mean the thing is as well as like all author well all movies based on books is that the author didn't like it, but it's never anything new. Like the authors are never gonna be happy, are they? Oh, I mean, there's J.K. Rowling. I mean, she created Harry Potter, but yet only about half of her books are actually in the films. Well, I'd argue less than that. But again, it's one of those things where I said time and time again, when it comes to making anything based on a book, they always end up either just picking and choosing what they like or they don't even give it a chance before the book is finished. So they just rush it out to make the money. Well, it's like what we were saying before. Like, when does it when does it stop being about the original story and starts being inspired by? Yeah, but the thing that I was completely amazed by: how long do you think the Swamp of Sadness scene took to make, like, to actually film? Oh God, um, I'm going to take a gamble and say like a month. Two months. Two months. Mm. Oh. But it's not a very long scene. That's what I don't understand. Like it's probably five minutes, maybe ten at the most, and oh. the only thing you get from it is that the kid basically gets covered in muck, the horse gets stuck, and that's it. <laughs> it but it's true though. Like Yeah. It, it's just it's such a bizarre movie. Like I <sighs> It's just so weird that it sounded amazing. There was a lot of hope behind it, I think. But by the time that they probably did the second movie, a lot of the actors had aged up quite a lot as well. Yeah. Because I think by the third movie, the kid was replaced. Yeah. Which I've never seen, but it always boggles my mind. Why change the main kid to somebody else when it's like the kid's going to age in real time anyway? But, well, you could argue the same thing with like what you've had. Well, for like two, like the two Home Alones, you had the same actor, Macaulay Culkin, and then for the last, the last two, there was two different kids. So, was there a fourth one? Yeah, there was a fourth one. I know there was a third one where it's all about um, these spies that were trying to get the kids' toys back. So he had a microchip in that he wasn't yeah. supposed to have. But then you had like a fourth one, which was absolutely rubbish. But. <laughs> Never seen the fourth one. Um, hmm. It's probably why you never heard of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it is like I say, a very bizarre movie. But like all eighties and nineties movies, oh yeah, it just. I think whatever they were on back then, it definitely wasn't anything legal, to say the least. But I don't know what else to add today. To be fair, because this movie. Well, I love it to bits, though it's just, it's so all over the place. Like, it just boggles my mind that you have this poor kid that goes through so much trial and tribulation, like, to try and save the day, to then end up back at square one at the ivory tower to be told by the empress, yeah, you didn't have to do anything. All you had to do was let the reader believe in us. And it's like, so you let this kid's horse die? You let the poor kid get attacked by wolves. You see, let him almost be obliterated by big titty statues. But no, none of that matters. Like as long as the the reader basically believes in your world, then all is lovely and fine. I just good <laughs> logic, I, I suppose. It's like what? Yeah, I. I have nothing more to add to this today, I'm afraid. There's not many times when you're left speechless. I'm not, no. Like Normally we'd be ranting on for ages, but this whole movie is basically summed up in one sentence. It's a load of bloody nonsense. Oh, yes. <laughs> but I think that's... Well, 
That's it for today. It's short and sweet for a change, but there we go. For next week, it will be Jack's turn. And what are we going to be discussing next week? Uh, it's going to be on the topic of unpopular opinions. So that's going to be going over series, films, film franchises, the lot. So what are some of the stuff that everybody like? Because sometimes I like stuff that Ben doesn't like. And sometimes Ben likes films or whatever that I'm not very into. But that happens. We've got contrasting opinions. And sometimes we can agree to disagree and love others respectively. But there's certain things which... Uh, which I know that we really don't like that we have moaned about together when it comes to movies and franchises. Like, I'll give you just a little bit of a taste, a little bit of an example of what we're going to be talking about next time. And films that everybody loves, and I cannot understand why, because they're all the same. Please, uh, this is an unpopular opinion. The Fast and Furious movies are all the same, and they're rubbish. <laughs> yeah, we will be discussing that next week. So... Again, thanks for joining us. Stay safe, stay home, and we'll see you all soon. Later. Hey.